this month's webinar is taxes, debt, and inflation. Oh my, uh, uh, a graphic and a theme that, that I love and uh, certainly is a nice little joke on the Wizard of Oz. Uh, but these are real concerns for many people um, in the investing community, of course, uh, in, in regular society and, and also those in retirement. So I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into those um, and talk about a little bit more detail and uh, answer some common questions that we've been getting. Again, uh, if you're not familiar with me or the Leonard Advisory Group, we are financial advisors, financial planners. Uh, we are not CPAs or tax accountants, nor are we estate planning attorneys, although uh, those are areas that uh, we, we might advise in in certain regards. So uh, this disclaimer is uh, discussing that. Of course, nothing that I cover today is considered individual advice. If you have uh, individual concerns, there will be an opportunity for you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one or a monthly webinar deep dive where we can address those individual concerns and questions. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I ran uh, the local 5K that we have here, and this year it was pretty exciting. Um, you know, it was freezing cold and running by Cold Lake, Michigan. Uh, who wouldn't want to do that other than uh, crazy people that like to run too much? Uh, you know, I was really excited because this year I placed fourth, and I looked back last year when I ran the same race, I placed 21st. Um, you know, this year I was also second in my age group. So I felt like, oh, that was, that was really good progress. And I looked back and I actually ran slower this year than I did the year prior, although I placed drastically higher. And well, like many events now, less people are attending. There were certain protocols that we had to take to of course be safe, uh, like wearing a mask until the race started, no indoor congregations around the event and things like that. But uh, it was, it was kind of funny to me that I'd done so much better. And I was reflecting on that and thought, well, you know, I guess that's consistency, right? If you keep doing things over time, you're bound to have luck fall on your side occasionally. Now, granted me placing in fourth didn't get me a million dollar prize or anything great, but of course it feels good to be in the top of any contest. Um, and, and it was certainly a fun event and look forward to uh, doing the Twin Cities Marathon in October of this year, which of course will be a lot more preparation for me and a bigger challenge. Um, but I'm looking forward to that. And hopefully by then, uh, we're in a little bit more of an open economy by then. Uh, so of course, today we're gonna to be talking about taxes, debt, and inflation. And these all fall into retirement plans and, and investment planning in general. Uh, you know, we break it down into five different categories. So of course, in retirement, you need an income plan. Where's that income going to come from once you retire and the paychecks stop or become a lot less? The second area is investment plans. So what do we do with those savings that you've accumulated over your working years to make sure that they can generate enough income and last as long as you do? The third area, which of course we'll be talking about in more detail today, is tax. So how do we mitigate taxes and how do we navigate taxes to make sure we're not paying too much? Fourth area would be health. So that can be addressing things like long-term care concerns or uh, Medicare uh, as you transition onto the Medicare system. Or if you retire early, how can we manage healthcare costs so that we're not paying multiple thousands of dollars per month um, that might derail other parts of your plan. And last off, or the fifth area uh, we talk about in comprehensive retirement planning is a legacy plan. So once you're done with those assets, uh, how do you pass them on? Another conversation that we have in legacy planning is also warm hands versus cold hands. So traditionally we think of legacy as once we're gone, uh, but certainly it can be things like funding 529 plans for your grandchildren or taking the family on big vacations while you're alive. So spending some of that legacy money to generate more memories and good times while you're alive. Um, so always like to put that up at the beginning and end of presentations to make sure that we're looking at things through the full lens. While we're gonna talk a lot about taxes and more individual risks that we might see on the horizon, uh, that is the big picture that we always wanna zoom back out to. Uh, so over the next 45 minutes, we're gonna cover three areas, uh, taxes, debt, and inflation. Uh, taxes, we'll talk a little bit about the current tax environment that we're in, some of the things that we might see change, 
and some of the common misconceptions we see around taxation in retirement. The second area we'll cover in the next 45 minutes is debt. Is it all bad? We'll talk a little bit about personal debt and also the government's debt. And lastly, inflation. Is it coming? Should we worry about deflation? What, you know, what, what concerns should we have around inflation? And what should we expect? Um, just like last month, uh, this month, uh, we will offer a $25 gift card for anyone that uh, responds to the reply form. And I will go ahead and shoot out a link to that um, real quick in the chat function. Um, and for anyone, uh, bear with me here one moment. And for anyone that also um, schedules a monthly webinar deep dive uh, to go a little bit deeper into any of the things that we bring up today, you'll be entered for a second chance to win the $25 gift card. Um, you don't have to be a client or even if you are a client, certainly you can participate. Uh, this is our way of trying to get a little bit more feedback and try to get people more engaged. Uh, so certainly uh, feel free to do so. And I am copying and pasting those links in right now. So you'll have them, but I'll refer back to them a couple of times throughout the presentation as well. Okay, I just shot both of those links out. The first one will be to the response form. And the second one is a link to my calendar to schedule uh, that monthly webinar deep dive. So let's get into it. Taxes, our current environment and common misconceptions. Uh, there's, when I was doing some research for this presentation, I saw this uh, quote and it's only accredited to a Morgan Stanley advertisement, which, which isn't too direct, but you must pay taxes. There's no law that says you got to leave a tip. Um, and there's other plays on this, but I thought this was a lighthearted one, right? It is all of our responsibilities um, as citizens of our great country to pay taxes, to help support the good of us all. Um, but we certainly don't need to pay extra. So where are we today? Well, the tax system's really complicated. I know on today's webinar, uh, we have a few uh, CPAs or tax accountants on the call today. So certainly they can tell you that there's lots of complexities. And, and what we see similar to many other professions is that people will find uh, niches or specialize in certain areas. So commonly we'll hear that, you know, uh, the, the tax code is over 70,000 pages and it's gone up in this graphic. It's showing from 1986 to 2016, from 26,000 to 70,000 pages. Well, how could we all possibly know all that and understand it? Well, a lot of it, again, applies to those niche areas or more individual things. What those pages are representing is the standard federal tax reporter. And this is really the aggregation of tax rulings and everything. So sort of uh, this quote makes it like saying that the, um, the alphabet is the length of the dictionary or calling the constitution the length of all the Supreme Court cases on constitutional law over time. So really they're exaggerating the, the point of the tax code. By no means am I saying that it's not complicated. In fact, it is quite complicated and it will continue to become more complicated. Why? Well, we have a really diverse economy and diverse people living in our country. So we need to equate for all these different things to try to balance out risks and rewards and different industries and um, incentivize behavior in different ways as well. Um, so one thing that I've had a good laugh out of, um, and, and maybe some of you understand this, Further is non-fungible tokens. I, I have had a few conversations recently about these. Uh, this is sort of the next stage of, of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies, but uh, this graphic that you see on the screen here sold in an auction for about 500. People are buying space in, in um, 
digital real estate as well. So we're going to have to factor these sorts of things into the tax code as well, which will make it more complicated. So part of my job today is try to help you navigate it, uh, especially for those in and nearing retirement, um, and take a look at what we're seeing on the horizon and what might change. Um, so first thing, um, President Biden has talked about repealing parts of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, there's been talk of imposing uh, the 12.4% Social Security payroll tax on those earning over 400,000 in annual income and also changing the capital gains tax. So let's talk about those a little bit further. And what's on the table, excuse me, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is possibly reverting the estate back tax back to 2009 levels. Uh, so what this would do is it would um, decrease the transferable estate uh, down to about 3.5 million. Uh, currently, uh, it's not an issue for most of our clients uh, that, that we're really looking at, at an estate tax issue by lowering it back down uh, to about 3.5 million. Uh, this would just cause some more estate planning, but the potential that your estate could be taxed at up to 40%. Uh, the other piece that they're looking at is raising that top tax rate from 37 to 39.6 or effectively 40%. Um, and also uh, raising corporate tax rates in a full repeal that could go as high as 35%. Uh, some sources are saying that they're targeting closer to a 28%. So these would be things that, of course, might affect you, especially if you're a higher income individual. Um, the other piece is social security. Uh, so social security here, we're looking at those with 400,000 or more in income, uh, paying into the social security system again. So the way that the social security system is currently working is if you're earning up to $142,800, you're paying 12.4%. Typically, if you're employed by a company, it's part you and part the employer contributing um, uh, to the social security system. Uh, what this new law would do is it would create a hole where you're not paying taxes between 142,800 and then 400,000, but anything above there, that tax would come back into play. Uh, the reason for doing this would just be to help strengthen the social security system. Um, there seems to be in a lot of this legislation, a targeting around 400,000 in income. Uh, really, this 400,000 in income number marks almost the start of the top 1%. I believe last year's statistics, it was maybe closer to 480,000 is what's considered the top 1%. Um, so certainly, it, it's affecting a smaller group of people. Um, many times, we'll see clients maybe near the end of their career, they'll hit that level or with severance packages and income, they might hit it for a one year off time period. Um, but again, this could be a positive for many retirees because it might help shore up the social security system as a whole. Uh, the other piece that's in the table is capital gains reform. So capital gains, if we buy an asset, hold it for at least one year and one day and then sell it, we could either be taxed at zero, 15 or 20%. Uh, what they're talking uh, about here is for those in income over a million dollars, raising that to almost 40%. If there's a net investment income tax on that, it could be even higher. But again, this is for income over 1 million. Um, the other piece that they're talking about um, potentially doing is a loss of step up in basis at death. I would see this as affecting uh, most of those clients that we interact with the most. Uh, so if I bought a stock today, let's say for $10, and if I passed away in 60 years from now, um, and let's say that that stock is now worth $1,000, and my, my two sons, Eli and Isaac, inherit that. Uh, under current law, the stock would be evaluated at the date of my death. So if the price is now $1,000, that would be their new cost basis. So if they decided to liquidate it that same day, they wouldn't pay any taxes on that. If it went up, let's say by 10%, they would only pay capital gains tax on that 10% growth. Uh, so that would be a pretty big disincentive for people to hold stocks for a long period of time. If we think about it, one of the reasons that we have the capital gains tax is, well, especially in the case of stocks, you're taking risk 
when you buy that asset. So we make the tax rates a little bit more favorable, encouraging people to invest in companies and help grow the economy. The step up basis at death incentivizes people to continue holding for a really long time. Again, keeping that capital in the markets, not pulling it out as frequently. Um, so I think moving away from that could be a, a pretty rough shock for the economy as a whole. Um, so I would hope to see that not happen and don't think that that's realistic. Uh, this taxation at over a million, this would probably be more rational. And, and we'll, we've seen articles over the last decade where um, very high net worth individuals, let's say Warren Buffett has come out and said that he pays a lower effective tax rate than a secretary. Well, certainly that doesn't seem fair and equitable um, that someone of that wealth is paying the same level as someone uh, with, of course, substantially lower wealth. Uh, so there might be a change there. Again, this would be quite a drastic jump up. Um, but this is one of the things on the table as well that we're keeping an eye out for. A uh, couple of common misconceptions that I wanted to talk about within taxation today are marginal tax brackets versus effective rates, social security taxation, and the idea that you will have lower taxation in retirement. So what would a discussion about taxes be without tax brackets? Here are the married filing joint ordinary income tax brackets for 2021. So any taxable income from $0 to 19,900 is taxed at 10%. $19,901 through $81,050 is taxed at 12%, et cetera, et cetera. I will not read them all to you today, uh, but certainly you can see them. So those are our tax brackets. Now, maybe you've been at the golf course with uh, your friend that, that you haven't seen in years and they'll say, oh yeah, oh, you know, Uncle Sam's killing me. And 24% tax bracket, he's taking almost a fourth of what I earn. Well, I'd say that's a common misconception you are not actually paying 24 cents on every dollar that you earn. So here I went and, and uh, made up a, an example. And this is a married couple over the age of 65 with $200,000 in annual earned income. So this isn't retirement income, this is income that they're earning. Um, so they're still working in this case. If we look at that 200,000, it really puts them right on the edge of that 22% tax bracket. But let's dig deeper. If we, uh, if we look back at the rates here and say 200,000, well, 200,000, they should be squarely in that 24% tax bracket, right? Wrong. There's a lot more to it than just following those brackets. This 200,000 in income would cause them to pay total income tax, and this is just federal, not state, uh, of $31,102, or an effective rate of 15.55. Now, if they earned one more dollar, their marginal tax rate or their tax rate on the next dollar would be 22%. So that next dollar, they would give 22 cents to Uncle Sam. Now, if you say, well, okay, how did we get that $31,102? Well, we fill up the brackets as they come. So again, between zero and $19,900, we're paying 10% in taxes. Or the most, if we fill up that, is $1,990 and 12% on anything over that. So again, if we keep tallying up, uh, we can come up with their total tax number. So here's the math laid out for you. Um, in this case, we are gonna take that standard deduction and we also get an additional kicker because they're both over the age of 65. So their standard deduction and exemption is $27,800. So that taxable income of $200,000 becomes $172,200, causing them to pay um, ordinary income tax of $29,381. Uh, they also incur additional fees, again, keeping in mind that they're over age 65, for higher income for Part B and Part D of Medicare. This is something that I'm not going to dig into today, to today, but uh, we do uh, pay additional premiums um, 
in Medicare Part B and potentially in Part D based on income as well. So this is something we have to think about in retirement as well, is how can we control our taxable income to uh, lessen the impact of that, if at all possible. Moving on to social security taxation. We hear a couple things commonly. Uh, one, my social security is taxed. Uh, people often assume that their social security won't be taxed. And other people say, ah, well, I have other income, so my social security is taxed at 85%. Um, both of these are sort of true. Uh, you could have completely tax-free social security income if that's your only source of income, or if you are under certain income thresholds. Social security taxed at 85%. Well, that's not entirely true either, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into that. So how do we figure out if our social security is taxed? Well, we use what's called provisional income. We get provisional income by taking 50% of our social security benefit, adding in our ordinary income, adding in dividends and capital gains, and non-taxable interest. Now, whenever I present this, people always say, okay, well, what's non-taxable interest? Well, non-taxable interest is generated by things like municipal bonds. So while they might not be taxable, they do get counted into provisional income, which could make your social security uh, income taxable. So um, this is how we calculate provisional income. Um, our benefits thresholds are the following. If you're single, up to 50% or 50% would be taxed above 25,000. 85% for 34,000. If you're married filing joint, these are higher, so 32,000 and 44,000 respectively. So what does that all mean? How does that work out? Well, let's run through an example here. Here I have a couple in retirement that um, have $20,000 coming in from Social Security and $40,000 um, of income via an IRA withdrawal this would give them $50,000 in provisional income. So again, we take that whole $40,000 and half of the $20,000 social security income. We subtract that first threshold of 32,000. We have $18,000 in excess of that. So in this case, I multiply it by 0.5 or 50%, which gives us 9,000. If we look at the second threshold, we take that 50,000 and minus the second threshold, of 44,000, giving us $6,000. Now this $6,000, the, the portion that goes above uh, the second threshold, we're gonna multiply by 0.35 or 35%. You might say, well, hey Josh, you just told me it was 85%. Well, we already equated for 50% of it in this first calculation. So what this would tell us, if we add up this $2,100 and $900, is that we would have total taxable social security of $11,100, which means 55% of that benefit would be taxable. So although you're hitting that 85% threshold, just like in the regular tax brackets, that doesn't mean that 85% of your social security benefit is taxed. Now let's flip it. And this is where income planning can be a high value in, in, um, in retirement planning. So let's say in this scenario, um, this social security of $20,000 um, really only represents one, uh, one, one spouse or one individual of a couple, uh, their social security. So let's say they both take social security. That bumps up their social security income to $40,000. So now they only need a $20,000 IRA withdrawal. This would only create $40,000 in provisional income. So again, we take that 40,000 minus 32,000, gives us $8,000, multiply that by 0.5 or 50%. It gives us a taxable social security of $4,000 because we didn't cross the second threshold or $4,000 um, or 10% of our social security benefit. So by altering those um, income streams, by altering those income streams, we're able to uh, get a lower taxation on our social security and actually lower taxation overall. Uh, the last myth or misconception that I wanted to cover is lower tax in retirement. Um, 
certainly you might have lower taxes in retirement, but I think that that idea has often been overplayed. Um, you know, I think the first question to ask yourself in evaluating that is what day do you spend the most money? And if we think about it, most of us that are still working probably spend more money on Saturday or maybe Sunday. Why? Because we have more free time. So um, maybe in more normal times, we might be going out to the movie, doing our, uh, going out to a movie, going shopping, going out to eat, those sorts of things. So we spend more money. Well, in retirement, if every day is Saturday, you might be spending more on a daily basis and entertainment or social activities. The other reason why we see that um, uh, taxation might not be lower is we're spending more for things on our bucket list. So um, maybe we've always dreamed of going to Italy for two weeks or taking a river cruise throughout Europe. Well, now we have the free time to do it and the assets to do it. So we're going to spend that money, which will create us being in a higher tax bracket or potentially the same uh, that, that we were during our working years. Um, the other thing that we see is sometimes people are forced to take money out of their 401ks or IRAs via required minimum distributions that actually push our income up so high that we're forced into a higher tax bracket. Now, this is a good problem to have because what that actually means is that, well, you've saved a ton of money, right? You've saved enough money that, that uh, maybe three to 4% required minimum distribution in the early years is forcing you into a higher tax bracket. Well, it's a good problem, but it's still a problem. We don't want to pay excess taxes. In that case, we might want to look at some Roth conversions or other strategies. Uh, the other reason that we would say for those looking at retiring in the next few years, that we might see um, your taxes be higher in retirement is we have really low tax brackets now. Um, if no tax laws change, we would see uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act personal income uh, expire in 2025. So in 2026, we would revert back uh, to our old tax brackets, causing us to pay about 3% more in total taxation. So certainly that could cause us to have higher taxes in retirement. So first action uh, that we'll say for this month's webinar is get a tax map. If you haven't done a tax map with us, I encourage you to uh, schedule a monthly webinar deep dive. Again, I'll send the link out in chat again. But if you click that link, it'll bring you to my calendar. If you schedule a time, you'll have a choice for a phone call um, or, a, uh, or a Zoom meeting. We can dig through, take your last year's tax return, plug it into some software, and look to see where you're falling in the tax brackets and see if there's any moves that we can make to help mitigate taxes in the short term. Um, if you've done a tax map with us in the past, Hey, now's a good time of the year to update it, especially if you just filed your taxes for 2020. Moving forward, let's talk about debt. Um, is it all bad? And we'll talk a little bit about personal and government. So uh, when people say, oh, well, is it bad to have debt? Well, I'd say, what's the debt for? And how much is it gonna cost you? Um, you know, for most, uh, for most Americans, our largest chunk of debt that we take on is whenever we purchase a home. Well, in today's low interest rate environment, that's really not that bad a debt. For one, it gives us a place to live. For two, we might only be paying two to 3% on that asset for up to 30 years. Um, that is relatively low cost to borrow. Um, so that could be good. That could be good debt. Bad debt can be things like credit cards that are at 20 some percent, um, where we're only making the minimum payment every month, that's going to continue to accumulate and cost us a ton of money. Um, credit card companies have done a great job of showing you on your statement, hey, you know what, if you only make the minimum payment, this is how long it'll take you to pay it off, and this is how much you'll pay um, in total payments. That's a, a pretty good, um, gives you a pretty good idea of the cost of that debt. Uh, so certainly, I would say that that's bad debt. Um, I took this screenshot on my phone over the weekend because I'm a dork and I, I read things like this in my free time as well. But this was world debt hits record of 
281000000000. And any, in other words, um, we have now hit $281 trillion in global debt. So it's not only the US that's racking up the debt, it's the rest of the world. And what this represents is 355% of global GDP. So in other words, we're pretty leveraged now. If we look at, um, and this is just US federal debt, this is federal debt held by the public from 1900 to 2050. And of course, anything uh, past 2020 is a projection. Um, so here we're hitting a peak, really we're at World War II levels now. Um, we're projecting that to continue increasing um, through 2050, um, where in the US it would become uh, almost 200% of GDP. That would be a big concern. I would say that most likely we're gonna see some things change here, but right now we have a lot of debt at low interest rates um, in general. Uh, we are looking at another stimulus package going through. So the case for more debt is, well, hey, it's still cheap now. So just like a home, we see lots of people um, sizing up in their homes, looking for a larger home at this time because interest rates are low and, well, they're spending a lot of time at home. So they're probably uh, evaluating that a little bit more. Um, the other reason that, that we'll probably see continued um, federal debt is because of the pandemic. So, you know, we have um, extra costs for, for protective equipment like masks, um, extra staffing to uh, distribute vaccines, and of course, get those vaccines out uh, to, the, in, to the smaller health authorities. Um, you know, at this time too, we are fortunate that the US uh, Treasury securities are still considered the safest in the world. So a lot of the world's money is flowing into the US for that stability over time. And, and really the yields are ultra low right now, but it's considered safe. Um, we would see rates staying relatively low for the next two to three years, but overall uh, they will trend up. Um, so we need to get the spending in check and, and sort of come up with a plan over the long term, uh, but we will probably see continued debt. Uh, interestingly enough, last year we actually saw a decrease in household debt. So individuals actually had less debt, which is a big plus. I shared this on last month's webinar as well, uh, but certainly an interesting point to me. Um, and, and some of that, uh, you know, can just be stimulus payments that people were actually saving them and didn't uh, quite use all that money. Um, as well as just being cautious. So that fear of losing a job often um, forces us to save a little bit money. Plus, if we couldn't go on vacation this year or we're going out to eat less, we might just be saving more money because there's nowhere to spend it. Um, so what's the concern with that increase in debt? Well, as income goes up, more of it will be needed to pay off debt. So again, if we think of it like a household. So, um, Yana and I have two kids, we're both working, we have lots of monthly bills and need to pay them off every month. If one of us decides, hey, you know what, I'm gonna go back to school and, and you know, get my doctorate or, or we go back to school and start incurring maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt, uh, even if our income takes a jump up once we complete that education, that income, a larger percentage of it is gonna go off to pay debt. The same thing occurs with countries. So as interest rates go up, our gigantic debt is gonna consume more of our annual revenues from taxation as a country. So we can spend less money on um, social programs or rebuilding infrastructure and things like that. Um, so that is certainly a concern. Um, it co could cause hyperinflation where all of a sudden inflation um, you know, really takes off quickly. Um, and I think the biggest concern to me is really just we could run out of runway or tools or levers to pull if the economy um, retracts again. So if we have another major pullback um, in the markets, if something else occurs um, that, that causes another crisis sort of compounding this, well, if we only have so much uh, runway left, it'll cause us more problems and cause a longer recovery in that instance. Um, so action number two, I'm going to say personal debt review. So take a look. It could even be, um, you know, if you've been thinking about, hey, should I refinance my mortgage? 
um, you know, that might be a personal debt to review. Or of course, if you have credit card debt, that's one we always need to look at and come up with a plan with. So if uh, you have some debt or you'd like to talk about the national debt a little bit more, schedule that monthly webinar deep dive. Again, I'll shoot the link out again, but it is in the chat function. Uh, so you can click it and schedule there. Um, this is something that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail and make sure that you're making the most out of our current environment. Okay, third area we're gonna talk about today, inflation, is it coming? And what can we learn from the past? Well, um, when I scheduled this webinar, all these headlines weren't up, but certainly over the last, uh, I guess, almost week and a half, inflation is back in the news. So uh, these were just some headlines I pulled over the past few days. Um, and, and most of them are really talking about stocks and the relationship with inflation, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But there is a lot of fears around inflation now. Um, I was talking with a client last week and had a good laugh that you know, uh, treasury yields went up to 1.3% and, and now concerns about inflation are coming out. So, you know, that high yield of 1.3%, all sarcasm um, intended, uh, is, is causing problems. It's sort of funny at this point, like if we tie up money for, for 10 or 30 years, the idea that we're making less than 2% is, is uh, kind of laughable. Um, but those are real concerns and, and they are things that need to balance out in the markets overall. So there are lots of fears. Uh, so we'll talk about some of those and those changing conditions. Um, there is increased debt. Um, you know, we talked about that on the federal. So the federal debt, uh, many times when we have lots of debt, we need inflation to help grow our way out of it. We need a growing economy, which can also cause inflation. Um, so that could push inflation higher. Um, especially for those of you that lived through the 70s, uh, ri rising oil prices is always a concern. And we're also um, in an environment where, uh, whether it's the Green New Deal or we're exploring alternate technologies and it's becoming more of a mainstream focus that, hey, maybe we're gonna move away, not completely, I think that's unrealistic, but more so from oil or petroleum-based products. If we do that, well, uh, and there's less supply and then that demand peaks, it can cause the prices to go up as well. Or if they're just making less of it in general, that could cause uh, prices to go up as well. Um, I do have to say though, when we look back to like the 70s versus today, uh, the Dallas Fed actually put a paper out at the end of last year, looking at the correlation between inflation and oil prices. And it's actually been steadily decreasing. Uh, we can see oil prices and inflation is now less than a 40% correlation. Um, so that's decreased quite a bit since the 70s. Um, uh, and, and for various reasons. So some of it is more technology based or um, uh, the, just the way that we're using oil today. Um, so it is still a concern, but less of an impact than we've seen in, in times like the 70s. We also have an increase in the money supply. So increase in debt, but we're also pumping more money into the system. Um, you know, of course we could, uh, we've all heard stories about like Germany uh, where people had to take wheelbarrows full of cash to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, that hyperinflation because the money supply increases at such a high rate is certainly a horrible fear. Um, don't think we're quite there though. Um, and then again, the next round of stimulus. So looking at pumping even more money into the system, well, that's gonna cause some more fears around these same issues. Um, pulled this from a CNBC article from the 17th, um, but the way that they're looking at market-based inflation instruments or a five-year break even would dictate that um, inflation would be about 2.37 over the next five years. Um, this is, to me, this is pretty logical. I think we will have higher inflation, but two to 3% inflation will not completely derail things. Uh, although we do need to be cautious because it will affect certain parts of the investment market. Let's talk about the seventies a little bit more. Well, what caused that double digit inflation? Well, we had Vietnam, we also had shocks in the oil market. Johnson's Great Society, uh, Nixon's wage and price controls. But more importantly, these things all added up over time. Um, so we had a steady increase to that point. Uh, 
I, I think we're still a long ways away from that. So again, my expectation um, from, from my research is that we're gonna expect inflation to be around two to 3%. Um, this can be a real risk, especially for those in retirement. We wanna be careful with duration. We don't want money to be tied up um, for extended periods of time to the point that uh, we are unable to move to higher rates when they become available. Um, one of the things that will help keep things in check is as the economy opens back up, we have all this pent up demand. So for Jan and I, boy, we wanna go on a vacation. Um, you know, Maybe at the end of this year, we'll be able to do so. So that pent up demand will start filling certain areas of the economy. Um, but that is unused capacity currently. So those industries or, or certain places are, are not being utilized yet. And we still have uh, high unemployment as well. So uh, by fully utilizing the economy, uh, we normally we have to get to that point before we start seeing inflation rising quickly. We also have been in such an extended time period of low inflation that expectations for wage increases are quite a bit lower. So it is um, for, for some employers in the Pittsburgh area, we know that it is common to not get any annual increases. Um, some are looking at two to 3%. Really, if you're getting 3% plus in annual increases in your wages, of course, without a promotion or anything like that, uh, that's really good in today's environment. So the idea that that would all of a sudden snap and people are gonna expect 10% increases um, is unrealistic. It typically flows over time. Uh, we were having um, a discussion uh, with team members at the Leonard Advisory Group. Uh, we are reading a book together, uh, The Psychology of Money. And we were talking about uh, you know, this idea that we are the product of our environments. We grow up in different time periods and different economic conditions. So we have different um, expectations and we need to be aware of those to cause caution. Well, for me, inflation has never been a big concern in my lifetime. Um, you know, it's always been low single digits. So uh, the idea that year to year things are drastically different just has not been my experience. So this is something that I have to focus on more uh, to make sure that, that we don't get caught off guard with it. But again, I, um, you know, when I worked um, for large employers, certainly no one was expecting 10% annual raises. Um, that expectation is not realistic. So our third action for this week is going to be to get a risk analysis. Um, if you've done risk allies with us in the past and looked at uh, your portfolio and what risks it's under, one of the features of this program that we can dig a little bit deeper in is we can lay out a scenario. So, hey, what if inflation does go up to 3% all of a sudden? How would that impact your portfolio? So if this is a concern for you, and certainly we can draw any assumptions you wanna see, we'll plug your portfolio in and take a look at that with you. This will give you a little bit of peace of mind or say, hey, you know what? Maybe you need to readdress this risk in your portfolio and change up some of the investments uh, to better utilize uh, the current marketplace that we're in. Um, so uh, I encourage you all to schedule, um, you know, in that 30 minute uh, monthly webinar deep dive, you can schedule it. And in the notes section, let me know, hey, I want to do a risk analysis. Or if you want to do that tax map or look at debt, just indicate what you want to do. If you want to do all three, certainly let me know that as well. I just sent the link out in chat. Um, one more time, so it should be readily available uh, for you to click on it and get it going. Um, we will circle back here to a comprehensive retirement plan. Again, today we really focused on, on tax and maybe some investment risks. But again, we need to uh, focus on income, make sure, like we talked about in the social security example, that we're taking income um, appropriately and that we'll have enough. And always think about our health and how we can properly navigate those health expenses along with our legacy plan. In our monthly reading as well, or our, our book, the, Psych the Psychology of Money that we're reading as an office, um, one of the examples that the author goes through is lottery tickets. 
And what we find is that the people that buy lottery tickets at the highest rate are most often the people that need to save that money as an emergency fund, more so than spend the money on lottery tickets. And of course, it's rational to say, well, why do they do that? That's foolish. Um, but you know, as we were talking through the tax as an office, it is this idea of escapism, right? So whenever you buy a lottery ticket, especially when the jackpot's really high, right? There's this, hey, well, what would you do if you won a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars? And, and you sort of get a mental vacation where you could think about, oh, you know, I would do this and that or buy a big house on the beach, whatever it might be. I think for all of us this past 12 months, almost a full 12 months now, um, being confined into what we can do, it is stressing us out a lot. So I would encourage you, maybe not necessarily to buy a lottery ticket, but hey, take a mental vacation. So, you know, think about maybe planning that trip at the end of this year and, and, and make a benchmark to look forward to and, and set your mind up to dream a little bit more. I know things are, are tough for people and you might be sick of looking into a computer screen or looking at a camera, uh, but you know, uh, things will get better over time. And I think we all have lots of things to be grateful for. Um, so although we talked about taxes, debt, and inflation today, wanted to end on a slightly positive note. Um, again, for anyone participating today, uh, if you fill out the form, um, give me some feedback, um, you'll be entered to win the $25 gift card. You can earn a second entry by also, also scheduling that monthly webinar deep dive. Um, in the feedback form, uh, we do ask the last page of it is if there's anyone that you think would benefit from these monthly webinars that we're doing. Um, I wanted to make it very clear to everyone that we are not going to uh, beat those people over the head. We're asking for name and email. Uh, I will send them an introduction saying who I am, send them a link to this webinar, and then also include them on invitations to future webinars. Um, and we'll fully disclose that they can unsubscribe or let me know that they're not interested at, at any time. Uh, we are not gonna hound them. We are just trying to help build the audience and make sure that this information is getting to as many people as possible. Um, so please don't feel shy if you think uh, someone might benefit from it. Uh, please include their name and email and we'll include them on the list moving forward. Um, hope everyone enjoyed today's presentation. Um, again, fill out that form. Let me know any feedback you have. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, it'll help me in building future webinars. For next month, I'm going to focus only on taxes. So we talked a lot about taxes today, but taxes are top of mind for everyone this time of the year. So we are going to do uh, taxes in retirement next month, where we're going to talk through a lot of details and taxes and talk about some tax strategies that we can use or common missed tax tips. Um, so keep an eye out on your inbox for next month's invite and uh, hope to see you all then.